Thank you for tuning in for this edition of WJTS Inform. It's another Friday, and State Senator Mark Mesmer, District 48, uh, he's, what he represents, is here to visit with us and talk with us about what's happening in the legislation. There was a lot of things that went on this week. Uh, also, it was the State of the State address by the governor. We'll mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit. But first, before we get started, in your area is a rest stop along uh, Interstate 64 between mm -hmm. Dale and Ferdinand. Correct. Um, and it, it is now going to be closed, and, and you've done some, some work checking into what, what's happening with that. Right. I, I did get plenty of calls and emails over the last couple of weeks when that notice went out that they were going to be closing it. So I had a meeting with NDOT this week, and I said, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? Because to me, the rest stop is not in, it's, it's not in a state of disrepair. Um, it, I mean, it, so they went through the, the analysis of, of what they're doing and why, and, and they're not just closing the Nancy Hanks you know, stops there. Any truck stop or any any rest stop, other than the ones where you enter from, you know, enter into the state where they're going to develop, you know, big welcome centers, and and about you know ten acres at each site for truck parking where they can park hundreds of trucks. They're gonna they're gonna make you know mega stops basically, I sixty four, you know, I seventy, I seventy four, I sixty nine, I sixty five. E each place where those major you know, you know, interstate, interstates come into the state, they'll be spending 20 to 30 million, you know, dollars at each of those locations to, to make them, you know, large stopping points. And, and that way the trucks have, they'll end up with, with way more capacity to handle the, you know, the truck, you know, the truck traffic, which is, I think, the big concern, you know, from most of the businesses around here, they just don't have the, you know, the facilities to handle, you know, trucks that would want to stop and park all night. So, uh, and I, I did ask NDOT, you know, and, and they're not just closing this one, they're closing about 30 okay. across the state. And I said, you, I said, you need to go. They said, what can we do? I said, you need to schedule a meeting with the local officials in Spencer County, somewhere in, you know, in Dale or Ferdinand or whatever, and, and, you know, pick an area down there and have a public meeting to explain your plan and what you're doing and why you're doing it. And, you know, it wouldn't be my plan of attack on how to, you know, how to handle the the additional need for you know for truck you know rest stops, but you know that that was the that was the plan they came up with and and and, and how they're going to implement it, and they just need to explain that to people rather than just say sorry your site is closing. Yeah, and a public meeting would do that. It would be very helpful. Now this was the state of the the uh, state address mm -hmm. by Governor Holcomb and your impressions. Uh, Tuesday night was his annual state of the state. He's constitutionally required to do that. And uh, his speech was about 30 minutes, and it was it was really uh, well delivered. It had some some innovative ideas in it that that were really uh, you know creative and and you know unexpected uh, ways he you know he, he proposed to deal with some of the issues that, that are you know facing the the state as we move on into 2019. Um, I, I think there was strong bipartisan support for you know for what he came up with and. One of the key elements that, that he focused on and that we've been looking for, you know, a way to focus some attention to this session was how to deal with additional funding for schools and specifically how to, you know, how to get that to the teachers and not just, you know, be distributed, you know, for more, you know, ad administrative expenses. And, uh, and in, in his budget plan, he's got allotted, you know, for 2% increases, you know, this year and next year, you know, in the budget and just, you know, general general fund revenue, you know, to the schools. But then he came up with, a, with an idea, and obviously somebody on his fiscal team probably, you know, came up with, with the idea, uh, to take some of our budget surplus and, and pay down pension liabilities, you know, that the local corporations owe, you know, for their teacher pensions, and pay that down, and, and it would free up $70 million per year, um, you know, for, you know, to local school funding that then they, you know, and, and he would do that with the expectation that that money get committed to teacher salaries. It'd be 70 million this year, next year, and, and you know, really on into perpetuity that it would free up, you know, if, if we pay down their, their pension liabilities now, it frees up extra uh, cash flow for them in, in, in years going forward. And when you spend budget surplus, you don't want to, you don't want to spend it on an item that ends up being a recurring item that you got to fund year after year, otherwise, you know, pretty soon your, you know, your budget surplus is gone and, and what you've intended to do just becomes part of the, you know, ongoing budget. So we've used pen, our budget surpluses, you know, in prior budget years to pay down other state, you know, uh, uh, long-term debt obligations and done, you know, done things that, that reduce our debt and reduce our debt payments. And, 
increase cash flow as well. We've done that, you know, at the at the state level for, you know, state, you know, future obligations uh, every year, and you know, got into the state with a triple A credit rating because of that, and 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 helped you know help build in you know long term you know more sustainable you know budget projections. So, doing this for the local schools will you know will help tremendously, and I think the combined with the two percent increases from you know from the state in each of those budget years to the schools plus plus that you know freeing up that pension obligation uh, will end up being about a five hundred eighty two million dollar you know increase to locals for you know for you know for spending over the next biennium which is pretty significant so that was uh, that was a fresh idea and and well received and, and it's something I think our budget guys can you know can get behind um, another issue he talked about and it really came up in, in a lot of meetings we had with business leaders across the state as, as Senator Bray and I toured the state to get to know, you know, lo lo uh, local officials and business leaders across the state, you know, as we took over leadership positions in the Senate this year. Really on the similar vein of the, the manufacturers, you know, four or five years ago, six years ago now, uh, when, we, when we dealt with the, the right to work issue and, and how key manufacturers uh, indicated that that was you know a, an item the state needed to move ahead on to to put us in position to to grow our manufacturing base and and you know be more you know be even considered you know for for job expansions and relocations on the manufacturing side for the for the high tech sector whether it's you know pharmaceuticals um, biomedical companies you know high tech computer companies that are wanting to locate here or you know who do have a presence here you know they're you know, Indiana is one of five states that doesn't have a bias crime um, statutes in our code. We do have, because of a, a Supreme Court decision about 10 years ago, j all judges have the ability in a criminal case where there's been a felony conviction already, uh, you know, under sentencing guidelines, if, if an average recommended sentence is 10 to 20 years on a specific, you know, felony, and if the average or the recommended is anywhere from 10 to 20, you know the average is 15. That's usually the recommended, you know, sentence is that you know, that midpoint. A judge, because of bias, and it can be for anything the judge chooses, whether it's you know race, religion, you know sexual orientation, they can add to they can they can take the sentence to the maximum sentence because of bias. And and we've got a few Senate bills. There's a couple of House bills dealing with. You know, putting what a, what judges can do, you know, by Supreme Court precedent in adding to a, a, a con, you know convicted sentence because of bias, and and putting you know putting what they can do by you know by judicial ruling in our code, and and the folks who who are in the high tech world say just as important for manufacturers were you know on on that our inability to attract workers, and have our national international parent companies, you know, continue to invest here, for them that's a big deal. You know, now does that really legally move the needle? Um, not really, if a judge can already do it, but judges are wanting guidance as well. When we're in the sentencing phase, you know, when, when you're looking at ag aggravators, you know, what should we include? So judges want to have some guidance and we had a bill that passed three years ago in the Senate that would have given you know judges that statutory authority to you know to you know when to and you know add to a, a sentence and 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 some people call it a hate crimes law. Well, it's really not a hate crimes law because states that have a hate crimes law, you can be you can be charged for speaking or or you know what you say you know can be that alone can be a, a criminal act. Well, this would not. I mean, this has to be strictly in a in an issue of murder or or battery or assault or rape or whatever. If 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 it was clear from what was said or or the you know the circumstances that that came out in the you know in the hearing that there was a bias involved in what you did. If you know if I'm if I'm wearing a you know Trump hat and I get beat up by an angry mob, you know I mean I could I could be the beneficiary of of that bias, you know, that bias crime in helping defend, you know, in helping the victim. So, um, it, it just allows judges to enhance a penalty. It, 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 it's not a standalone hate crime that some states have, and most states that have, you know, the bias crime aggravators, it's it done the way we're proposing to do it, but we are one of only 
five states that doesn't have it in, in statute. And he pointed that out in his state of the state. And it's part of my pre-session survey that I've sent out and you know, my preliminary results. And really the results across the state are, it's probably a good thing for the state to do as a whole. I think statewide, the, the support is about 75%. Um, you know, my early results from my online surveys are in that same range. So, I mean, I don't know that it's, it, it, I don't know there was any part of the state where it was, you know, not supported at least by the majority of the people of any area. Um, not sure we'll get it done, but we're gonna, you know, we're gonna talk through it as a caucus and, and, and try to make sure we shape it in a, in a way that, you know, if there is a list of, of things that are considered an aggravator, you know, we wanna make sure everybody's, everybody's included, you know, some way or another. Um, so, uh, and then he gave a real good report, a report on our, on our you know, up-to-date economic statistics. I think I've reported on that on my, my weekly, you know, uh, radio column that I do occasionally. Uh, but over the past, you know, past several years, Indiana has continued to lead the Midwest and, and lead the state in a lot of economic, you know, growth. Uh, we've got the highest jobs partition, jobs partition rate, rate percentage uh, in the Midwest of all of, and of all of our neighboring states and are ahead of the na national average on job participation, on unemployment rates. Uh, we've had uh, over 30,000 job commitments the last two years, you know, you know, through IEDC on, on future commitments for jobs. Uh, now those, those people aren't necessarily employed yet, but it's what, you know, job companies announce they intend to hire 500 people or 1,000 people or whatever, or relocate here and bring X amount of jobs. You know, in future job commitments, we've continued to set records uh, and, and uh, continue to have, you know, s you know, strong, solid budget surpluses. So, I mean, a lot of things are going the right way. We want to continue to, to do what we can to, to, to tackle the next, you know, next most important, you know, issue or the next biggest imp impediment to keep Indiana on that good growth trend. So our, our income growth, uh, Last year and, and this year are, are pacing ahead of what we had in our, you know, budget to, from two years ago. So we're, I think right now we're $178 million ahead uh, with just a few months left in this current budget cycle. So things are trending well. We just want to continue to do, you know, good policies that, that keep that trend moving. Um, very happy to hear, and I, and I think on my, my press release that I sent out from the state of the state, uh, very excited to hear the governor uh, wanting to, and including in his budget, $100 million for rural broadband grant programs. Uh, we passed some of the structure to that last year, um, and I'm sure, you know, through this budget process, you know, we'll, we'll get that $100 million, you know, uh, commitment, if long as we can all stick together on, on, on his objectives, but to grant uh, rural broadband projects in unserved areas across the state, I, mean, I think we project in total, it's probably about a two million, two billion dollar, you know, cost to do that, and and his, and his hundred million would be paired with probably you know five to six hundred million of of you know uh, private industry, you know the people that are in the in the broadband business, you know, paired with that, it would it would be this hundred million would just help uh, help you know push along those those high cost areas and and, and get them done a little quicker. Um, but it's a great start, and, and after we get this in and deployed, you know, we'll look at it after this by annum and see, okay, what's left and what technology changes are out there that, you know, eventually we're going to probably get to some tough to get to areas that, that are, you know, that, you know, still may be hard to address, but it, it's, a, it's a big shot in the arm, mm -hmm. and, and very, very happy to hear that. A lot of areas in, in my district, you know, could use that. We have a lot of unserved, you know, broadband areas. Uh, and then, you know, continuing to work on uh, workforce development issues. Uh, if kids want to go to college, we, ne we need to continue to prepare them with four-year degree preparation, but we need to offer and, and continue to have bills looking at how do we retrain adult workers and how do we get kids' skills uh, and career assessment uh, process started, you know, for all kids. We, we, had, we had five counties over the last two years or five school corporations that were picked as kind of test pilot programs for that career assessment evaluation process. Uh, it's time to, you know, and let's, let's look at our benchmarks and make sure it did what we thought it would do, but we need to get that deployed to every kid in, in the state of Indiana to where by the, you know, by the time they're in the eighth grade, we look at their interest, you know, their skills, uh, 
uh, and, and what type of careers and, and pay scales are available for those and steer kids you know, to the career path that'll get them there. So um, very excited where we're, where we're headed with that. And then uh, school safety uh, grants that we uh, upped the amount of last year, um, continue with our, in, in with, we had 30 million the past few years, last year we bumped it up to 36 million keep that grant program in place, but also give schools, you know, the tools they need, you know, through property tax, uh, you know, uh, access with more flexibility to get to get those, you know, school safety processes in place fast. Um, there was a, a school bus safety bill that, uh, that somebody had passed. To, I mean, number one, to try to keep kids from having to cross highways where they enter the bus, where they've got to cross the lane, but enhancing the penalties for people who do run a, you know, a bus stop arm. Um, I mean, try to disincentivize that practice as much as you can. Um, and I think, you know, continuing to make strides on infant mortality, uh, you know, rate issues that, that uh, have we made some headway on the past couple of years with nu nutritional programs for expectant mothers. Okay, now we haven't gotten to, to bills that happened this week. Mm -hmm. Let's have you come back Monday. And we'll do, uh, we'll do a short show on uh, what bills have happened this week. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for watching 18 WJTS Inform. We have had with us State Senator Mark Mesmer talking about uh, the governor's um, presentation of the state of the state this week. Thank you for watching. We are local people watching local people.